Thank you for tuning in to Manifesting Sons broadcast. Today we would like to share with you an impactful message by Dr. Mark T. Jones Sr., building a life that glorifies God. We hope you enjoy our program. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, and we're going to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. And I want to give us some principles for building lives that glorify God. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Somebody shout, we all know something. But now watch the warning or admonition of the text. It says, knowledge does what? Knowledge puffs up, but love does what? Say it with me. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Now, now watch this now. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, our second verse, and we're going to jump into this. Ephesians 4, 15 says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects in the him who is the head, even Christ. Say, speaking the truth in love, we'll grow up. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor. If you'll let someone speak the truth to you, you'll grow up. Come on, tell your new neighbor. Say, new neighbor. If you'll let someone speak the truth to you, you'll grow up. Father, we thank you for the anointing that is upon your word to help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of your will. I want you to take note of this reality that I've extrapolated from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. My knowledge of God might not necessarily serve God. <laughs> my knowledge of God might not necessarily serve God. You know, it's very possible that your knowledge of God could be serving your ego. Because anytime... Anytime you put what you know about God, about how you treat people, your knowledge of God is in vain. I'm going to say that again. Anytime you put what you know about God ahead of how you treat people, then your knowledge of God is in vain. In other words, say with me, my knowledge of God is no good if I don't know how to treat others. Oh, come on, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, it doesn't matter how many scripture I know if I don't know how to treat you. Tell your new neighbor, say, new neighbor, it doesn't matter how much I prophesy if I can't even speak to you. Tell somebody behind you, say, neighbor, it does not matter how many gifts I have if I don't know how to handle your gifts. The Bible says... The Bible says knowledge, and watch this now. It doesn't matter whether it's learned knowledge because you've been in the books with all your looks. It doesn't matter whether it's revelatory knowledge because, watch this now, you can be a prophetic wonder and a people mess. It doesn't matter what you say about God. If you don't know how to treat God's people, God doesn't care anything about your knowledge, neither do we. Because knowledge does what? But love does what? Now watch this now. When you tell somebody, when you really know something about God, then you'll be building something in me. <sighs> when you really got the good part, of the knowledge of God, then that will translate to how you serve God in your sacrifices for the people of God. Because it doesn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter how many scriptures you know if you haven't made them applicable. You understand that, believers? Knowledge puffs up. But the Bible says love builds up. Write this down. Your knowledge of the things of God can give you an inflated view of yourself. You know, there is, that's part of the seduction of this particular class and age of prophetic people. Because one of the seductions of this age is that there are some pr prophetic people in this age who believe that their knowledge of the things God has revealed to them in the realm of the Spirit nullifies them of the responsibility to treat God's people the way God sees God's people. 
Say it with me, knowledge puffs up. But what does love do? It, it doesn't matter what you know if you're not using that knowledge to serve the context of edification. You understand that? You're not here to outshine anybody. You're not here to outdo anybody. You know what's sad about many people in the body of Christ? It's, it's twofold sad. You got people that don't really know how to operate in their gifts, and then you got other people that are jealous of their gifts. You jealous of gifts they don't even know how to use. And so it's a double, it's double foolery. Because on the one hand, somebody don't understand that it's not about charisma. Somebody said it's not about charisma. It doesn't matter how charismatic you are if you have no character. It doesn't matter. Every gift has to have a silver lining called character. Because it doesn't matter if you can prophesy accurately if you can't live in alignment with God's will. Character matters. Integrity matters. Now watch this. Love matters. Because let me show you something. When you love people, listen. When you love people, you don't compete with your gifts. When you love people, you don't usurp their authority with your gifts. When you love people, when you love people, you're not trying to outshine anybody. There are some of you right now that you know how to tap rams of the spirit, but you don't know how to share the spotlight with nobody. I said there's some of you right now that you know how to access certain dimensions in the spirit, but you don't know how to share. Look at somebody tell me you got to learn how to play well with others. Anybody else, anybody else, when you see all these anointed people come forth teaching and preaching and ministering and singing and dancing, anybody else really blessed by the diversity here? When I... When I see you not trying to be me, tell somebody you bless me when I see you not trying to be me. Come on, tell somebody else, you really bless me when, when, I, when I see you being yourself, being used by God. So I thank God for the diversity that is in this house. I thank God that there are so many anointed people. You know, I, I told a pastor recently who came here while I was gone, and they were talking about how powerful our service was when I was gone, right? And y'all don't know, man, when people tell me how powerful the service is in my absence, my chest stick out, right? Because one of the things that I've always wanted to be was unneeded. Oh, y'all did not hear what I said. See, people that want you to thrive don't want you to become codependent upon them. People that really want you to thrive want you to grow up and go be wonderful under the anointing that God's got on your life. So I said, man, I, so one of the things that I said to this person, I said, man, you know what? I said, I thank God you told me that. I said, because one of the things I love is that you can come into manifestation worldwide and anybody could be preaching and teaching and you could swear they're the pastor. Now why? Because of their anointing, because of their, their charisma, their gift in operation, because of their sense of identity, because they know their value, because they respect and know how to flow under the anointing of God. To me, that's what it's all about. Amen? Ain't none of this a one-man show. It never has been a one-man show. Y'all got that? So your knowledge of the things of God can give you an inflated view of yourself. Tell your neighbor, check yourself. Now watch this now. It, this is why, this is why, as I said a little bit earlier, there are some of us that really need to take a look at how we have been approaching the things of God. Because it doesn't make any sense for you to know all the names of God and none of the names of God's people. Somebody told me to repeat, repeat that. Some of us know all the names of God and none of the names of the people on your row. And I, I submit unto you that no matter how, no matter how godly you claim to be, I'm going to say it and see if the class remember it. 
Every claim of godliness has to endure human trials. You can't claim to be godly and not have your claim of godliness tested by the human. Tell somebody, I'm here to test your godliness. See, because it's easy to say that you know God, you have a relationship with God, you have insight from God, but then you can't stand no test with your brothers and sisters. Some of y'all right now, and I, I really do believe that God brought you here, listen, for some of you right now, God brought you here to develop roots, got to get your root system right. Some of you, God brought you here to develop, listen, emotional depth. Now, why, say emotional depth. Now, here is why. Because you are a spiritual wonder, but you are an emotional casualty waiting to happen. Because you don't understand, if you look at your word of God and you look at all of the people that were really used prophetically and powerfully in the word of God, it wasn't an external enemy coming against the anointing on their life that took them under. It was the capacities of their emotion. They had not done, come on somebody, they had not done the work to build emotional depth and resolve. And so the moment people rejected them, Moses, then they undermined their own progress because even though you can part red seas, even though you can call down judgments, even though you can operate in a prophetic realm, you have no emotional depth. And if you don't develop emotional depth, tell somebody it's going to keep you out of something you're supposed to go into. If you don't develop, if you don't develop emotional depth, it, it will keep your lack of emotional depth will keep you out of promises that have been prophesied over your life. I'm talking to you right now. If you don't develop an emotional capacity to weather any storm and still love. If you don't develop the emotional capacity to fall out with a brother and be just fine tomorrow, if you don't develop the capacity to overlook an offense, if you don't develop the capacity, somebody shout, I'm going to love you anyhow. I'm going to love you anyway. If you don't develop emotional depth, it doesn't matter how much prophecy has been put over your life, you ain't going to never enter into it. Because as long as the enemy know that all it takes is for you to get twisted with somebody, for you to stop coming to church, as long as the enemy know all it takes is for somebody to step on your toes and then you will no longer operate in your gift. If the devil knows that all it takes is for somebody to correct you in the wrong attitude and you'll never come back to church again, then he will undermine your destiny through your emotions. Tell somebody he ain't coming at your anointed self. He's coming at your emotions emotional self he ain't, hey tells my he ain't coming at your anointed self he's coming at your emotional self come on tell somebody else he ain't coming at your anointed self see because he knows the anointing is a whole nother person so he's coming at who you think you are he's coming at the residue of your history that is filling your soul he's coming at your offenses he's coming at your unforgiveness he's coming at that record that you keep of wrong if you keep a record of wrongs with other people the devil will constantly use that record to undermine your progress Tell somebody he's coming at your record of wrong. Oh, y'all. He's coming. He's coming at your record of wrongs. He's coming at your record of wrongs. Listen, say no. Say when I'm under the anointing, it's not me. It's Christ himself. He ain't coming at you there. Because he knows there's another man that's standing up on the inside. Woo! There's another man. Somebody shout, when it's the anointing, it's not me. Shout, when it's the anointing, it's, woo! it's not me. Oh, my. But watch this now. But he knows, he knows not to come at you under that anointing, the anointed cell. So he wait till you leave church and you're in that other cell. The one that don't know how to let nothing go. The one that keep repeating offenses. The one that keep regurgitate disconnection.
distraction, the one that keeps causing division, the one that keeps undermining other people, the one that keeps talking negatively to people while you smile in their face. That's the one he comes at to undermine your trajectory. Tell somebody he's coming at your emotional self. So watch it now. As long as Moses was operating in the spirit of God, the hand of the Lord. Now y'all know the hand of the Lord in the Old Testament is the same Holy Spirit that anoints us under the New Testament. As long as he was operating under the hand of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. Mighty works he did. You understand that? Open, and, open the Red Sea, call down plagues. All kind of powerful things were happening. But because he let people get under his skin. Now watch this now. And notice he never let an Egyptian get under his skin. It was a family member. You know what I just said? It was, tell somebody, it was somebody in the family album. I need you to look at your Bible. It was somebody that was one of the tribes of Israel. It was always somebody connected to him by blood. Tell somebody, Egyptians can't do what family members can do. Come on, tell somebody, devils can't do what family members can do. I'm telling you that if we're going to go forward as a faith family, we got to be delivered from us. Now watch this now. Now you see Cornelius, no matter what people do, I remain unbotherable somebody asked me why you ain't keeping me out of the promise of God that's over my life you're not keeping me from the glorious future that God has seen me you're not keeping me from my promised lands you're not keeping me from entering it hey you're not keeping me from entering into everything God has shown me tell somebody you ain't worth my inheritance Come on, tell somebody you ain't worth my inheritance. You aren't worth getting upset with you. It's not worth what God showed me. So why is it now? So he's working through your feelings. Oh. Wouldn't it be a shame that you prophesy accurately and don't eat any of the fruit of your prophecies? Wouldn't it be a shame if you saw your prophetic future accurately and because you don't know how to deal with family members? You can't even enter in and experience the fullness of it because, watch this now, because you haven't done the work in your emotions to be a resolved enough person to do ministry. Listen to me. An ordination does not make you ready for ministry. I'm telling you from 20 some years of ministry, it takes something deeper, something greater, something broader than an ordination. You have had to have time with God where God does something so eradicable in your soul that nothing people do moves you. You have got to have time with God where God is able to deliver the leanness of your soul where you have your orientation right. Whatever I do, I do as unto the Lord. I ain't concerned about what you do, what you don't do, what you say what you won't say somebody shout ask for me in my house we will serve the you ain't been with God long enough to be resolved you have gifts but you don't have resolution you have you have anointings but listen to me anointings will not save you from emotional warfare let me learn you something. I know how to act when people playing with you. I know how to act when people are smiling in your face, but they're doing other stuff behind your back. I know how to act in the presence of duplicity. There's some of you that only know how to execute in the presence of affirmation. Until you learn how to execute, 
attitude in the presence of duplicity, you ain't got nothing. I know how to love people don't love me. I know how to serve people. Listen, I know how to serve people in their flaws, knowing that they would expose me if I had the same flaws. There's a depth you have to have. There's a depth, there's an emotional depth you have to reach. There's, there's a lot of resolve that has to take place on the inside of you. I said this recently. I know for a fact God has trusted me because I know how to deal with crazy people. Oh, that's it, man. Now, one of the things I learned a long time ago about people and whatever they're going through is how to separate myself from your state. Separation of church and my state. Why? Because I'm going to tell somebody, I'm going to be whole over here when you meet me. Oh. Come on, tell somebody, I'm going to be whole over here when you meet me. Complete over here, not wanting or missing. Listen, you understand that? So rejection don't matter because I didn't need your affirmation. You understand that? Abandonment. Abandonment? What is that? What is abandonment? You've left me with Jesus. I don't think my stock just went down. And you know why some of you get mad when people abandon you? Because they left with you with you and you don't like yourself that much. If you tell the truth, the only thing you've discovered is that when you deal with people, you see yourself. Can you, ask your neighbor, can you see that? When you deal with people, all you're seeing is yourself. I was having a conversation with one of my employees this past week, and they were talking about the stuff people do and the stuff people say and all that. And here's what I said. I'm, I'm going to teach it to the class today since I taught it to an employee the other day. Okay? Whenever people are coming at you twisted and sideways and doing all kind of craziness, right, it say it's good. Some of y'all couldn't even say it. <laughs> All things. Come on. Do it. Do it religiously. Because some of y'all right now, you do it religiously. You quote that verse religiously. But the moment something happened, you acting crazy. I said to this person this. Whenever people target you, whenever people criticize you, whenever they talk about you, whenever they malign you, whenever they... Whenever they do all kind of evil against you, smile in your face, backstab them, right? Say this with me. Satan is after my influence. Mm. Say it again. Satan is after my influence. You know, for some of you, Satan cares more about how you affect people than you do. So he's after your influence. So it has to be somebody you care about. Because if it was somebody, if it was somebody you didn't care about, you wouldn't care enough to give him access. So let me show you what happens. And I said to this employee of mine the other day, said whenever this kind of thing happens with people, and it's going to keep happening as long as you need to be delivered from people. Whenever this happens, say it with me, he's after my influence. Now, now, now. So if they, let's say they lied on me, right? And then now, if I still got a little bit of ghetto in me, I'm thinking vengeance, right? Oh, I'm finna handle this because I know way more dirt on you than you know on me. Hello, somebody. I know way more about you than you know about me. I'm finna handle this. And the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not. Now watch this now. The very fact that what they said caused vengeance to comes up in you, tells you that it was good they said it because you would have never known. You would have never, never known. 
that vengeance was hiding on the other side of your hallelujah. You would have never known that you could be so malicious yourself. Say it with me. It's good they said it. It's good they said it. It's good they did it. It's good they didn't do it. It's good they acting like that. Why? Because I wouldn't. Now, now why is this important? Why is this important? Say they after my influence. Satan wants to use my influence to affect a multitude of people in a way God never intended. So God says, I want to make sure that your influ influence is pure. Right or right? So watch this now. So the reason that this individual, these individuals, said what they said, did what they did, didn't do what they didn't do, tell somebody, God's trying to show you something about yourself. God's trying to show you something. Because watch this now. Whatever come up in you, say it's mine. Whatever come to mind, it's mine. And more importantly, more importantly, it could taint how I use my influence. So God wants to make sure I don't taint how I use my influence. See that? God wants to make sure I don't taint. For example, you're doing your best and they come at you all critically, right? And now all of a sudden, you all spin out emotionally because they came at you sideways. Well, then God's got this massive door for the purpose. God has purposed your influence for something out of this world. If you come into this arena with that ego, if you come, if you mess around and reach the place where your gift makes that room for you, and you still have a big ego hiding beneath false humility, so God makes sure that you have an intersection with a family member that causes your ego to rot. You know what God said? You got ego, deal with it now before those doors open. If you don't own it, you can't grow. Tell your neighbor, if you don't own it, you can't grow. That's why when you get to going, it's them, it's what he said, it's what she said, it's how he acted, it's how she acted, it's how you're avoiding deliverance. You're avoiding deliverance. Tell somebody, if it come up out of you, it's yours. If it come up out of you, it's yours. And say this with me. It was good that I was afflicted. Now why? I would have never known what I'm capable of. I would have never known what I was capable of if a church member hadn't tried me. Now, you know what this means? Don't blame other people for what God's delivering you from. Y'all don't, don't want to hear this, though, do you? Because if you can make it their fault, then you don't have to get on the altar again. If you can make it their fault, then you don't have to fast and pray to get the leanness out of your soul. If you can make it their fault, then you can default your deliverances to a call of demonic attack. This ain't no demonic attack. This is your deliverance. Now, let me share something with you. Y'all can sit here looking at me however you want. I already got what you want. Have had it a long time. I am, I am already at where you need to be, been here a long time. Don't call it a comeback. So I am trying to help you to step. Like Paul said, I'm laboring that Christ be formed on the inside of you. Because if we don't do something about that emotional self that can't stand no fire, that emotional self that can't weather no storm, that emotional self, you can't deal with nothing unless it affirms you. And this is why your enemy gets so much of your timeline. Because you can't deal with nothing unless it's in the affirmative. And the moment, at the moment that something just looks like it ain't going to affirm you, there you go, fighting again. 
There you go fighting fights that God told you to retire from Mayweather a long time ago. Tell somebody, you know God told you to retire from them fights. Come on, tell two people, you know God told you to retire from them fights. But you keep staging a comeback. You keep staging a comeback. And one day, you're going to mess around and get your block knocked off. And you ain't, there's some stuff you don't recover from. All right, let me get, let me finish this. Let me finish this. So say it with me, knowledge puffs up. So watch this now. So knowledge can puff you up and have you thinking that you're on track to build an effective life, but it will eventually disappoint you because it is devoid of the essence of the knowledge giver. Knowledge makes no sense unless you have the essence of the knowledge giver, and God is love. So let's talk about how to build a life that glorifies God. I'm gonna be out of here in a minute. First of all, you gotta embody, watch this now, you got to embody the essence of what it means to really walk with God. Walking in the essence of God is what walking in love is all about. It means, watch this, it means intentionally, say intentionally. Intentionally living a life that benefits other people. Tell somebody I'm here for your benefit. Come on, tell somebody else I'm here for your, some of y'all can't even say it. Some of y'all cannot even say it. Come on, tell somebody I'm here for your benefit. Now watch this now. So love means that I'm intentionally living a life that benefits other people. Number one, God is love. First John chapter four, verse seven says, beloved, let us love one another for God, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God because God is love. So the first key on this journey of building a life that glorifies God is understanding that, say it with me, God is love. So watch this now. So I've got to learn how to walk in this love because that's what it means to embody the very nature of God. God is glorified by that which embodies his nature. Listen to me. God is glorified by that which embodies his nature. You understand that? That may not be gifts, but it will always be love. Come on, somebody. Number two, if we're going to build through love, we've got to learn selflessness. Write that word down. Selflessness. When you're really walking in love, love is not I love you with the love of the Lord, knowing you can't stand them. Love makes other people the beneficiary of your better qualities. Are y'all hearing me? Love makes other people the beneficiary of your better qualities. This is what glorified God, and it sets a precedent. Write this down. The kingdom serves those who serve others. Say it with me. The kingdom serves those who serve others. Say it again. The kingdom serves those who serve others. Why? Because that is the spirit of the king. Here is love. Listen to me. Here, Y'all heard me say this before. Here is love. When I come into your life as a prophetess, I'm not thinking, oh, my God, she a prophet, she can prophesy accurately, she can make my church blow up, right? And now turn that wheel and use that gift, right? Like this is a circus, and we take the woman with the beard to use it to get money. <laughs> this ain't no circus. I'm thinking about what is my assignment in Pam's, come on, somebody. What is my assignment in charity's life? I'm thinking about how can I benefit you with my gifts? Now watch this now. So love means, write this down, love means I'm making other people the beneficiary of my gift. Now, the kingdom serves those who serve others. If y'all could get this right now, it'll change your whole life. The kingdom serves those who serve others. Now listen to me, believe it. I have no shortage of anything in life. Now here is why. Because my life is over. My life is given to the service of other people. So the, king, oh, so the kingdom serves those who serves others. It is more blessed to than it is to? What does that sound like? The kingdom serves those who serve others. So a critical key to building a life that glorifies God, tells somebody you got to become selfless. 
So when you engage people, your first thought should be, in this engagement, what's in it for you? I'm, I'm just here for what's in it for you. I'm just here to discern what my assignment is in your life. Watch this now. Watch this now. I don't need your attitude to compliment my assignment. No. See, some of y'all don't realize you disqualifying yourself when you disqualify others. When you disqualify people based on an attitude, you're telling God he can't use you with certain people. Would y'all look around at this motley crew? Take a look, take a look around at this motley crew. I mean, take a good, take a real good look around. You got all kind of people in this place, right? You got all kind of people, all these ages, all these variations. You got, you got baby boomers in here. You got generation Xers. You got millennials. You got Ys. You got, right? Why are all these people doing anything together? Uh, let me help you with that. Because they know for a fact one person love them all. You, uh, you understand, believers? You understand that what calls the people to galvanize, what calls the people to connect to your leadership is love. And when they engage you, they know, you know why there's so many people here that come from a lot of sexual or, uh, offenses and all these kind of uh, uh, trauma that have happened. You know why? Because when they connected to our leadership, they knew we wouldn't rape them. They knew we wouldn't molest them. They knew that they knew there was no sexual attraction. They knew that, that we would not be more. Tell somebody, don't be more of my pain. Come on, tell somebody, don't be more of what traumatized me. You got to be different than what traumatized me in order to get my trust. Y'all didn't hear what I just told you. Y'all didn't hear what I told you. You got to be more of what you got to be. You got to be different from what traumatized people to get their trust. You understand that, believers? The key is selflessness. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, what's in it for you? So watch this now. So I don't, as a pastor, I'm talking to pastor how you do this, right? I don't need to be comfortable with people to pastor them. Y'all didn't hear what I just said? Here's something else. I don't need you to like me to love you. It's all about the assignment. <laughs> this is between me and God. You got to get the right orientation about why you do what you do. And it changes everything. You understand that? Now, write this down. Write this down real quick. The reason I keep getting hurt is because I'm selfish. Oh, I don't see nobody writing. Post, <laughs> post it. Post it. Post it. The reason I keep getting hurt is because I'm selfish. Now, you know what? Nobody want to be hurt in church, right? Nobody want to be hurt in church, right? I've been 27 years in church. I don't know nothing about church hurt. Now, you know what I notice? The more I lose myself for God's agenda, lose myself to God's agenda, see that? the more I become insulated from the drama people go through so that I could be effective in my engagement in the lives of those to whom I've been sent. You know why I take this so seriously? Because God trusted me to influence you for kingdom good. Woo! Say it with me. This is a trust. So God trusted with me to make an impact in your life for eternity. Do y'all realize when y'all heard all the lies changed in this ministry y'all realize how much it glorifies god when a life has changed somebody that was off course begins aligning with the will of god tell somebody and that happened under your influence somebody who was abused come to proper identity and come to know their value and that happened because of your influence somebody that was broke come to prosperity and start advancing the kingdom and that happened under your influence y'all realize what it means when a one life is changed a generation has been affected this is serious tell somebody this ain't no homecoming competition this ain't no this ain't high school she, look how she looked at me. Look at why she keep watching me. 
Why would you be concerned about something so petty when we're called to do something so prophetic? Why would you be concerned about something so petty when we are called to do something so... Somebody shout, I am transforming lives. Somebody shout, I'm affecting eternity. Now watch this now. God is being glorified through my involvement. Say that with me. God is being involved, glorified through my... Say it again. God is being glorified through my involvement. You know why? Because all of a sudden, under your influence, people are bearing fruit. Hearing is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Under your influence, people are bearing fruit. People that were barren are now birthing. People that were fruitless are now bearing fruit. People that were hopeless now have hope. People that didn't serve God now serve God. People that didn't know their left from their right now have wisdom and revelation and knowledge and disrupt. Somebody said it happened on my watch. And God is glorified. Now, watch this now. Don't reduce this. To, listen, and, and if you really be honest, some of y'all right now are still having the same fights in church you had in high school. And that means it ain't us. Number three, write this word down, warfare. Why is love and building with love? Say, I'm building in love. Why is love so important when it comes to warfare? Write this down. Because love violates the very premise of demonic warfare. Y'all hear what I'm telling you right now? Tell somebody the devil don't know what to do with you when you walk in love. Come on, tell somebody the devil don't know what to do with you when you walk. Why? Because love frustrates the plan of the enemy. The plans of the enemy are predicated upon your predictability. He knows that when you get depressed, you're going back to fornication. He knows that when you get depressed, you're going back to drinking. He knows that when you get rejected, you're going back to smoking reefer in all of its form. He knows that when somebody coming to you sideways, you're going to be looking for somebody that you shouldn't be around no more. So, so love undermines the plan of the enemy. When you decide to walk in love, say love makes me unpredictable tell somebody I'm gonna overlook that listen I'm gonna need you to give two of your neighbors credit right now go ahead and put a couple overlooks on the fence look at somebody tell them for the next two things you do I'm gonna go ahead and overlook those go ahead and put a couple credits on the book come on tell them I'm gonna overlook that now you ain't even done nothing but tell somebody I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna overlook that I'm gonna go ahead and put a couple overlooks on credit because I know you prone to doing something crazy by the time the month is out tell somebody I'm gonna overlook that I'm gonna, I'm gonna overlook that So you know what gets me with some of y'all? You shama la ma 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 And you know all the names of the devil. And you know all the spiritual milky ways and all the and the one thing that would make you impervious to demonic attack, the one thing that would cause you to take a licking and keep on ticking, the one thing that would make you res that would make you resilient in the face of warfare, you don't know that love is a weapon of war. You all didn't hear me. Love is a weapon. Love is a weapon of. Some of y'all know all of the A to Z on warfare, but L ain't in it. The one thing you need, you still haven't learned. The one thing you need, you still haven't learned. Love is a weapon of mass destruction oh, to demonic warfare. Y'all hearing me? Love is a weapon of mass destruction. You understand that? A person who shall remain nameless because I like covering people who would expose me easily. This past week, as I was sitting in my office at home, 7.54 a.m., somebody who's been very vocal about being against me and against this ministry, somebody who's been very antagonistic to what we are doing here, somebody who has just railed against every aspect of our ministry and criticized my leadership and so on and so forth, text me at 7.54 a.m., and said, I want to admit my ignorance and apologize for my error concerning you. Now, now hold on. Hold on. Hold on. 
here's one thing I never did, right? Repeat the offenses. Here's one thing I did while this person was going and saying all they said. I ain't going on no post to correct me. I, I, I know who I am. I know who I am. Says somebody, my identity is sure in him and my value has not changed. Now watch this now. So the very one that was maligning me was on my prayer list. God have mercy. God save. God open the eyes. God save. And what happens is this. Somebody say, love wins. Y'all did not hear what I just told you. I said, love is a what? Love is a weapon of mass destruction to the plan of the enemy. Understand that? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take up an offense because you do. I'm not going to take up an offense because you do. Acts 24, 16. Herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience devoid of offense between God and man. You know what Paul said? I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to practice offense-free living. Now, write this down. Offense makes me incarcerable. Y'all realize... I'm getting ahead of myself. But y'all realize that the only reason demonic agendas work is because you were in unforgiveness? An emotional door. You had an emotional door. That's why the agenda worked against your life. You were in unforgiveness. You were in bitterness. You were in jealousy. You were in envy. You had an art. You had a complaint against them. That's why the demonic warfare work. That's why you can't get above what keeps coming against your soul. Because as long as you hold something, it holds you. You understand that? So, of course, I gladly received it. And I said to this person, this, listen, not only do I accept your apology, I said, but you know what? If you need closure, I, I don't know what I've done to you, but I apologize likewise to you. Now, now watch this now. I don't know what I did other than be me. But if this is what you need to close this chapter of your foolishness. Love wins, y'all. Love always wins. Love always wins. So now watch this now. So love violates the premise of demonic warfare. Okay, love frustrates the plan of the enemy, which are predicated upon our predictability. Listen to me, believers. Love, if you love God, you will obey God, right or right? So how can you be trapped if you're obeying God? If you love your neighbor, you will not create incarcerable offenses. Ah. In order to be arrested, there has to be an offense. Come on, somebody. Everybody can't be arrested. You have to violate a what? You got to violate a what? Watch this now. And against such, there is no law. What's the first one? Love. There is no law. Oh, God. There is no law against love, which means when you walk in love, you cannot be held by no demonic power. That's why the wicked one touches you not. That's why when a witch walk in the church, I heard they join it. That's why when a witch walk in the church, I hope they join it. You know why I know? Because against such, there is no law. You walk in love, whatever's on them is going to break off under my leadership. Hello? I ain't finna get with no witch. Witchcraft don't work on me. There is no witchcraft against Israel. The wicked one touches me not. It won't work. And y'all complain about witchcraft because you won't do the work in your soul to get to become impervious to it. There has to be a basis for witchcraft to work. And you mess around, you know, I don't know, you mess around and you walk around holding offenses against other people and you don't understand why the witch's weapons work on you is because you are incarcerable. You violated a law, the law of love. And when you break a law, you can't be incarcerated. 
So why are you now trapped in the same cycle again? Because you broke a law called love. And when you break the law, you can be pulled over again out of your prophetic lane and you can be arrested by another devil. You understand that? I've been married to this woman 30 years. 30 years I've been married to this woman. Okay? One of the things that we learn to practice is this. Every day, she make me new. Every day, I make her new. Why? Because we learn that you can't walk around holding offenses with your spouse and think you're going to walk in victory. You understand that? How many of you, he makes you new every morning? If you can't make somebody new every morning, you, you need to stay single. Don't tell somebody, don't you marry nobody. If you can't make somebody new every morning, stay single and save us all trouble. Because <laughs> if God makes you new every morning, you can't do that for somebody else. Say it with me. I have forgiveness on deposit. Think about this. I've got all this forgiveness on deposit. How can I not withdraw some and give it to you when you do something stupid? I said with me, I have this massive reservoir full of forgiveness. I'm waiting to pay it to somebody else. Y'all understand that? So I've learned, all right, I've learned, and I'm trying to teach you, learn to a practice offense-free living. Offense-free living. You understand that? Offense-free living. Don't let the sun go down on your what? You understand that? My wife used to get mad and try to give me the silent treatment. I'm like, number one, girl, you like to talk. This is going to hurt you more than it hurt me. <laughs> you and I know you want to say something. So, so, so I said, let's go ahead and fight. I know we got to have this fight over before the sun go down. Cause so let's go ahead. Let's do this. <laughs> Anybody else? I, oh, brother, go toward the fight. Oh man. I don't try to avoid no I don't try to avoid no fight with my wife. When I know she wanna fight, I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> ain't nobody going nowhere. Ain't nobody going nowhere. Ain't no hey, ain't no we are locked in love. We're in a covenant relationship. Covenant keeps you locked in when you got to go through deliverances in your show. <laughs> ain't nobody going nowhere. I ain't got no plan B, neither does she. Y'all got that? So, I'm, uh, so I ain't trying to, listen, I ain't trying to uh, avoid no argument. Arguments make us stronger. I was listening to somebody else say, we've been married 20 years and we ain't never had an argument. I'm like, somebody is oppressed. Somebody is oppressed. Somebody is oppressed. Because as long as you got an opinion, there's going to be an argument. As long as you got a difference of priorities, there's going to be a serious discussion. As long as y'all keep discovering that we have ide ideological differences about how to raise kids and manage money. I'm telling right now, if your spouse don't never argue with you, they got another spouse in Clearwater. I got to finish. <laughs> Write this word down. Consecration. Consecration. Somebody shout, love builds. Now watch this now. Watch this now. You do not love God if you won't consecrate your life to him.
You do not love God if you will not consecrate your life to him. I don't care what your mouth say. You do not love God if you will not live a consecrated life. Ask me how I know. Where the married people at in the house? Raise your hand if you're married. Now, if raise your hand if you're married. Raise your hand real high. All right? Now, now, if, if you have an open marriage where your spouse can sleep around with other people or, and you don't mind, keep your hand up. Y'all know they got this kind of stuff going on, right? No, we've had people join our church as swingers, and they won't be swinging on my watch, but we had people join our church as swingers. That's a sidebar, all right? But now, so, 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 so when you married your spouse, you expect them to be exclusive with you. You expected them to be completely committed to you. You don't want them sleeping around with other people. You don't want them texting other people, all in other people inbox, right? So you expected that they will be separated to you in their sexuality. That's called consecration. Ain't no way you can tell me you love somebody and you sleeping around on them. Ain't no way you can tell me you love somebody and you won't keep yourself completely committed unto them. And the sweat in the same way, there ain't no way you say you love God and won't consecrate yourself in a relationship. Somebody shout, it's a whole marriage. The bride of Christ. The groom. It's a whole marriage. If you don't consecrate yourself unto God, you don't love him. You have a head knowledge of God. Because love of God will show up in a consecrated lifestyle. Tell somebody, if you don't live a consecrated lifestyle, your mouth love God. These people draw near to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far. If you don't live a consecrated lifestyle, your mouth love God. Your gifts are deceiving you because you don't realize you can do everything God ever wanted you to do with your gifts, but that does not mean you have God's approval. You can devote your gifts to the devil and they'll still work. You can devote your gifts to the devil. They'll still work just fine. That doesn't mean God approves of it. That doesn't mean God blesses it. And that doesn't mean they will ever find God's favor. Y'all got that? Here's the next word, instruction. I'm almost done. Y'all came late, so don't worry about it. Instruction. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. But we don't need to write you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Did y'all know this was in the Bible? Say it with me. The Holy Spirit has taught me how to love the people of God. So watch this now. So another key in building in love is that the Holy Spirit, God himself, teaches us how to love. Because love is a derivative of being mentored by the Spirit through your life's occurrences. Tell somebody, the Holy Spirit is teaching me how to love you. Y'all understand that? That is one of, I don't know why. We'll use the, the Holy Spirit for everything except learning how to love people. We, man, we will use him to access realms and dimensions in the spirit. And then the moment somebody throw up a little bit of resistance, we will cancel them like nobody's business. That's saying, Lord, show me how to get to the sister. Show me how to love this sister beyond all these flares she's throwing up. Show me. Oh. Throw me, show me how to love my brother even though he mean mugging me. Come on, show me how to love my sister even though in her eyes I can see she can't stand me. It's amazing to me that we will use the Holy Ghost as a host to the realm of the as a host to the realm of the spirit, but not an instructor on how to persist in love. Now you know what married people can appreciate this. Because I remember early in the 90s when I ran out of love for my wife. <laughs> I, I, I ran out. I ran. The tank ran dry. And here was my prayer. Holy Spirit, show me how 
to love this woman with your love because I'm out. Now, if I were to take a show of hands of how many people ask the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to show you how to love difficult people, I guarantee you, we'd be very low on that prayer. Tell somebody, that ain't on your list, is it? Scripture very clearly says he will teach you how to love in the context was the faith family. Scripture teaches the Holy Spirit will teach you how to love one another. Who's the one another in the text? The faith family, the family of God, the people of God. Us is, wheezies, right? The Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach you how to love difficult family members. Oh, Lord Jesus. But it's easier to avoid them than it is to go through the class. Thank you, man. I thank God. People, right? The confessional is open on the front walls here. <laughs> it's easier to avoid them than it is to go through the class. Did we, are we reading the same Bible? First Thessalonians, what was it? First Thessalonians 4 9, right? Pull it back up for me if you would. I want y'all to look at this again. There, oh, I don't have on my glasses. I was, I was, when I was 30, I could read them. I'm 51 now. Now, but we do not. Paul said, we don't need to write you about the importance of loving each other. God himself has taught you how to love one another. Now, wouldn't it be a shame that in the faith family, you have learned how to speak in tongues? You have learned how to tap into your gifts. You learn how to flow in the prophetic. But you never ask for the class on love. When he said, God himself has taught you how to love one another. That's a whole class, and that's the class. Listen, before you get another prophetic class, that's the one you need to take right here. Y'all got that? Because faith work it by love. That work it, word work it is the word energizo, means energy. Your faith is energized by love. Your faith would be on a whole other level if you walked in love. All right. That brings me to the next point. Write this down. Fearlessness. Fearlessness. Love builds fearlessness. So watch this now. So being perfected in love eradicates all fear. Oh, my God. And it unleashes the most courageous version of yourself. My God. First John 4 verse 18 says, there is no fear in love, but, per but perfect love casts out all fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth not is made perfect in love. Somebody shout fearlessness. See, and this is critical also to building lives that glorify God. If we're going to walk in fearlessness, unbridled courage, we have got to be perfected in love. Y'all see how critical love is to this whole walking with God and building a life that glorify him? Love is critical. It is the quintessential. The most important thing you need to learn in the kingdom of God is how to walk in love. The most important thing you need to learn in trying to exercise your gifts, walk out your assignment, is learning how to walk in love. This is the most important thing. Security. Number seven. Love secures people under your leadership. It increases your influence, and it becomes a trust for greater. Write this down. Loving people and using people are not the same thing. Come on, ask somebody, are you a lover or a user? Loving people and using people are not the same thing. I said loving people and using people are not the same thing. People become secure in your leadership when they know you love them. You know, I've had some people in this church over the last 20 years that have gone through seasons where the enemy hit them with something and they couldn't do everything they would do before. And I call them up, hey, where you been? Well, I haven't been coming because I can't give like I used to give and I can't serve like I used to came. You know what I told them? Listen, I love you, not what you do. Come back to church. I love you, not what you used to do. You know they used to say, if you don't have your tithe, don't come to church. Anybody ever heard that? Like, listen, listen. I love you, not what you give. I love you, not what you do. It doesn't matter. Listen, we want to make sure that the enemy, the enemy doesn't undermine you in your isolation. 
mindset. We want to make sure that the enemy don't get you over there to yourself and start making you think you're not worth what God called you to do with your life. You understand that? So let us love you back to wholeness. Let us love. Loving people and using people. I love you and I, I need you are not the same thing. Oh, God help me. Y'all hear what I said? I love you and I need you are not the same thing. There are people that need you but don't love you. Y'all hear me? Number eight, yokes. Love breaks stubborn yokes. Love breaks stubborn yokes. It is difficult to persist in arrogance and aggravation against someone who has only demonstrated consistent love to you. It is very hard to kick against that prick. Y'all understand that? Love, say love breaks yokes. Now, narratives, write this word down, narratives. When the love of God is in a fixed position in your mindset. You tend to deal with difficulties, setbacks, and unpredictable elements of life more patiently, graciously, and triumphantly. As long, say it with me, God loves me. And nothing can change that. Now what do you mean by that? When you are, when you are fully persuaded in your heart and your mind, love, God love me no matter what God allows. God loves, say it with me, God loves me no matter what he allows. Now, you know what happens? You're able to weather the storm when that's your narrative. You're able to press into the, the awkwardness when that's your narrative. You're able to persist in, in moving in the direction you should when that's your narrative. Say it with me again. God loves me no matter what he allows. Now, watch this now. When that narrative is what resonates on the inside of your heart, somebody shout, I'm weatherproof. It, it, it makes you weatherproof. You can go through anything because you know where God stands in your life. You know, you know exactly where God stands in your life. You understand that, believers? So love builds in your narrative because as long as you have a narrative of God that's in alignment with who God says he is in your life, you'll get through anything. You'll get through anything. Y'all got that? All right. And here's the last thing. Love never fails. Write that down. Love never fails. So when you restrict your behavior and refine all of your motives to love, you begin tapping into a realm that the Bible calls, watch this now, fail-proof living. Fail-proof living. And I'm going to show that to you, and we're going to wrap this up. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, the scripture says love never fails. Prophecies will, tongues will, everything's going to be still, knowledge will, but love never fails. I want you to turn to one last place and we're going to be done. 2 Peter chapter 5, verses 5, 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm sorry, verses 5 through 10. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10, and we're going to be done. Because I want to show you all that love is the key. Say it with me, love is the key to fail-proof living. Watch what the Bible says here, and I want y'all to pay close attention to this because it ain't going to change for anybody in any generation. It's going to always be true, no matter what you're going through. Second Corinthians, uh, Second Peter, I'm sorry, 1, 5 says, Besides this, given all diligence, you have to add to your faith virtue. It's not enough to have faith. Say, I must have virtue. What do you mean by it? Moral purity. You have got to add to your faith moral purity. Tell somebody it's time for you to live right for real. Come on, tell your neighbor it's time for you to live right for real. Say it again. It's time for you to live right for real. You have to add to faith moral purity. Virtue. you got to add virtue. To virtue, you've got to add knowledge. To knowledge, you have to add temperance or self-control. You have got to stop being so impulsive. Hello? To that, you've got to add patience. To patience, you've got to add godliness. To godliness, you've got to add, watch this now, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. You've got, listen, it's not enough to have faith in God. You have got to learn how to be kind to God's people.
It's not enough to have faith in God. You have got to learn how to be kind, not suspicious, not malicious, kind. All that matters is your influence, not, watch this now, not their agenda. I haven't seen an agenda that worked against me. I said I haven't seen an agenda that worked against me. Because if God be for me, your influence, not their agenda. Now watch what he says here. For if, say if, if these things be in you and keep growing or abound, they will make you that you will never be barren. You will never be unfru unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll keep growing and producing in Christ. Y'all see that? But if you lack these things, you are blind. You can't see far off. You've forgotten that you've been purged from your old sins. He said, wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, here is where I'm going and I'm done. He says, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Never means what? We fall down and we get up. Not me. You notice what he said here? I'm done. You know what he says here? He says, if you realize that it takes more than faith to walk with God. It takes more than faith. You got to add something. Because walking with God, the spiritual side of walking with God is easy. Believe him. Right? But now watch this now. It's one thing to believe him. It's another one to behave like him. That's the part that a lot of believers miss. It's not enough to believe God. Say, I've got to behave like him. So, so I've got to take my faith. I believe God. How many of y'all know you believe God? Now watch this now. I've got to take that faith and I've got to add to that, listen to me, moral excellence. Moral excellence. I got to make sure that I'm not corrupted in my heart in the way what's going on in my heart. I've got to add to that self-control. Say it with me. I've got to stop being so impulsive. I don't have to respond every time somebody say something stupid. I don't have to respond every, every time somebody think I'm attractive. I don't have to respond to that. I don't have to respond to every impulse. I can nullify and kill those things under the power of the Holy Spirit. But one of the things I want you to notice here is that this is a compounding reality. He said you have faith. That's how you got in God. But now you've got to add something to your faith if you're going to have the victories God has purpose concerning your life. Listen to the promise of Scripture. If you do these things, you will never fall. Now, how many of y'all believe that that word is untrue? How many of y'all believe it's true, right? Yes. So God has, say it with me, God, God. has purpose for me, me. fail-proof living. Fail now, you know what I know for a fact? Before you fall, you feel. Yes. And the question is, what did you do when you felt what you felt? That's the question is, what did you do when you felt what you felt? You always feel something before you fall. The question is, what did you do when you felt something? You understand that? The scripture says very clearly is that if you simply add to your faith these other elements, God said you'll live above what's trying to defeat you. You will live a fail proof. You will not fail. You will not fall. You'll, in other words, you'll be steadfast. Un Y'all know the scripture? Y'all tired? Just pretend I, I'm little baby. Amen. Yo, Yo Getty. I'm finna. What's his name? Yo who? Yo Gotti. I'm. Which one? Just pretend I'm. I'm the baby. All right. All right. I got you now. All right. Cool. But the point I want to make, and I'm done with it. Stand your feet if you would. The point I want you to really take home is this. Say it with me. Love builds. Church, love is what builds a life that glorifies God.
Now, I got to let you know straightforwardly and candidly that love will make you look like an absolute punk. <laughs> love will make you look naive. Love will make it look like somebody getting over on you. When you walk in love, you will seem to be at a disadvantage to these agendas around you. But here's what I can promise you. Love never fails. It never fails. It wins the war. It wins the war. So say it with me. I'm going to let love fight my battles. I'm going to let love win my wars. See, now, last thing I'm going to say to you is this. We're a great army of people starting from 20 people years ago in a storefront garage. We're a great army of people. Most of our members aren't even in the room today. Okay? They'll be here on Easter. I want you to understand this. People will walk through those doors in all kinds of conditions. Some will be sincere, some will be insincere. Some will be learning, some will be lusting. <laughs> it doesn't matter what condition people come in those doors in. All that matters is that you have been perfected in love. That's all that matters. Now remember from the beginning what I said. Love is me making you the beneficiary of my best self. So the only thing you need to be concerned about, listen to me, say it with me. It's my job to love people. It's God's job to change people. My job is to make sure that you have no reason to not change by looking at me. My job is not to change you. You understand that? It's not my job to change you. God does to change you. I'm going to tell you that as I look back over my life, these 29 years of walking with God, I could have never changed myself. But you know what really brought about the greatest changes in my life was understanding the love of God for me. You understand that? Now, as we embody that, people will come into an people will come to an understanding of God's love for them by how you and I treat them when they walk through these doors. Tell somebody, make sure you're about that. Make sure you're about that. Okay? Now. Thank you for joining us today. Visit us for one of two services on Sunday mornings, 8 o'clock and 10.30 a.m. There are so many ways to partner with us. If God is using this ministry to impact your life and you would like to reach others by sowing a seed, text the word GIVE to 754-210-8654. Visit www.centerformanifestation.com to stay connected with us. Also, visit us on YouTube at Manifestations Worldwide. This is the season for the manifestation of the sons of God. Be blessed and manifest.